Hello, health champions. Today, we're going to talk about the top 10 signs and symptoms of high blood pressure. And what's really important here is that we don't just try to memorize a list, but that we understand which ones might be early signs, which ones are emergencies, and which signs are most likely due to something other than high blood pressure. Symptom number one is severe headaches. And this would be if your blood pressure goes up so high that it increases the intracranial pressure and it feels like your head is going to explode. Now, this would probably be a very severe pain and most likely not relieved by aspirin or the usual headache medications. And it's also not going to be brought on by just a little bit of increase in blood pressure. It's going to be due to something called a hypertensive crisis. And what is that? So there's not an exact definition of the classifications, but here's kind of how I look at it. So optimal is often said to be where your systolic is less than 120 and where your diastolic is less than 80. So systolic is when your heart contracts. That's when the heart muscle squeezes and pushes the blood into the blood vessels. Then when the heart relaxes and fills back up with blood, now there's still some pressure. There's still some base tone of that artery, and that's called the vascular resistance. So that's like your baseline, and that's the diastolic. Then when the heart squeezes, that's the difference between diastolic and when it goes up to systolic for a moment. And the reason I put a question mark on optimal here is that very often in the health field, in the traditional way of looking at things, the bottom range of things are open-ended. They figure that a high blood pressure is a bad thing, so lower must always be better. And therefore they say less than is optimal. Well, it's not really true because if it goes too low, then that also indicates problems. And we'll touch on that a little bit. But I would say that optimal is right around 120 over 80, plus minus 10 points or so. So a normal range would be 120 to 129 over 80 over 84. And don't get too hung up on just a couple of points back and forth, because these are things that fluctuate. High normal would be 130 to 139 over 85 to 89. So to me, as long as it doesn't get too low, all of these are totally okay because people are different and there's no real health detriment to any of these levels. Next is a grade one hypertension. And this is where we want to start watching. We don't want to freak out. We don't want to jump on medication because there is no evidence that this is truly harmful. Now, I don't believe it's a good thing to be in this range chronically, but there's also no evidence that it's very harmful. So we have some time to work on it. So this is where you make some lifestyle changes. You learn what high blood pressure is caused by, which we're going to talk about. You address those things. You manage some stress control and relaxation techniques and so forth. And more often than not, you're going to be able to bring it down and control it to where it doesn't get out of hand. Grade two hypertension, however, this is where the blood pressure is too high. Once we get over 160, over 100, now there are health consequences. This is where you really start increasing your risk of vascular accidents, of cardiovascular disease, of strokes and aneurysms and really, really bad stuff. So if you get into this range, this is where you definitely want to get on some medication if you are unable to control it. Now, if it only gets up into here a few minutes here and there when you get stressed out and most of the time you can keep it in the high normal, then that would still be all right. You still want to figure out why this is happening and bring it down. Uh, but this is definitely too high and this is a concern. And then when the blood pressure gets over 180, over 110, this is what we're talking about is a hypertensive crisis. This is an emergency. And if you can't bring it down, if it doesn't come down 
either by itself or with some breathing exercises in just a few minutes, then this is an emergency and you want to get some medical help to get it under control because this is something that is out of control and if it escalates, then that could be a really bad thing. Sign and symptom number two is nosebleeds and this can happen from high blood pressure, but it is kind of rare and it would have to be pretty high blood pressure again. More than likely, you're looking at a vitamin C deficiency where you have some micro vessel damage because your connective tissue isn't strong enough. It's basically scurvy that can affect things like gums. You could get bleeding gums and also much more likely to get nosebleeds. But again, this is not going to happen from just raising your blood pressure a few points. This is most likely going to be a hypertensive crisis. It's going to be massively elevated blood pressure. And this is an emergency. So if you feel like your nosebleed is because of high blood pressure, then you definitely want to seek some help. Number three is blurry vision. And it's the same mechanism here. It's small vessel damage. That high blood pressure can damage small blood vessels, can destroy them so that they leak. And the organs where we have these tiny blood vessels, they don't function normally anymore. So high blood pressure can cause this, but we want to understand that most likely the number one cause by far is type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance. So for a lot of these signs and symptoms, we don't want to jump to conclusions. We want to understand what the most likely causes are and address those. Number four could be blood in the urine. But if you find that, realize that the most likely cause is going to be a urinary tract infection. Don't jump to conclusions. And if high blood pressure causes blood in the urine, now you're going to have severe kidney damage. You're going to be at the end stage of kidney disease where not just proteins and minerals are leaking out, but whole blood cells are leaking out through the kidneys. And this would be an emergency, of course. And the kidneys is another organ where you have these small vessels that can be damaged. The eyes and the kidneys are the primary organs that can da get damaged that way. And while it can be high blood pressure, again, it's most likely type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance that's going to cause this. And if you have type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance, then that's the primary cause. But this also is the primary cause of high blood pressure. There are two basic mechanisms that cause high blood pressure. And the first one is metabolic. When we have metabolic problems, when we're metabolically unhealthy, then it causes all sorts of damage. It causes mineral imbalances, hormone imbalances, swelling, bloating, etc. And type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance causes chronically high levels of insulin. And when we have these high levels of insulin, that causes exaggerated sodium retention. It causes the kidneys to recycle more sodium than they would otherwise. And sodium binds water. Water follows sodium. So if we keep more sodium, we keep more water. Now we have an exaggerated fluid volume in the vascular system that puts pressure, that basically expands the blood vessels extra above the baseline. And the second cause is neurological because we have a brain and a nervous system that can respond to things in our environment. And whenever we have stress, now the nervous system perceives that there is an emergency, that whenever we're being chased, whenever we're being attacked, when there's a danger, we're going to need more fuel delivery. We're going to need more oxygen, more glucose, more blood delivered. So the body is going to raise the blood pressure. This happens on purpose. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But it's your sympathetic nervous system. The part of your nervous system that you don't think about that gets things done anyway, it's called the autonomic. It has two branches called the sympathetic, which is your fight flight, your parasympathetic, which is your feed breed. And if you have a lot of stress, if you develop a chronic stress, then you're going to have what's called a sympathetic dominance that's going to drive that blood pressure up a little bit 
chronically. So most likely, if you don't have insulin resistance and you have high blood pressure, then it's very, very likely that it is caused by stress and it is something that you could reverse with things like meditation and breathing exercises. Number five is fatigue and shortness of breath. And this is very often listed as a symptom of hypertension, of high blood pressure. But is that really true? Well, it's kind of a very, very loose connection. We kind of really have to stretch. So what they're often saying is that if you have a myocardial infarction or a heart attack, then one of the symptoms is fatigue and shortness of breath. But we have to realize that this is not caused by high blood pressure. There's an association between people who have cardiovascular disease and people who have high blood pressure. So they figure if you have a heart attack, then you probably had high blood pressure. But if you have a heart attack, you're not going to be worrying about your blood pressure in that moment. So it's not really the blood pressure causing this. It is an association. Cardiovascular disease is simply correlated with high blood pressure. Another thing that can cause fatigue and shortness of breath is something called pulmonary edema or pulmonary hypertension. But again, there's not a direct cause from the hypertension, from the high blood pressure. And here's how that works. So right in the middle of your chest, pretty much, you have a heart, we hope, and it has a right and a left side to it. And if you're looking at the person, then this would be the left side of the heart and this would be the right side of the heart. And then when blood comes into the heart, it comes into the right side. And then the right side, it pumps the blood out and it goes to the lungs. And the purpose of the lungs obviously is to put oxygen into the blood and then we can return the blood to the left side of the heart and the left side pumps it out into the wider circulation, into the systemic circulation, your arms and legs, and your body. And then it uses up the oxygen and then it comes back into the right side of the heart again. Now, if we have pulmonary edema, if we have metabolic disease, if we have heart failure, if we have different things that don't work so well, and we get some fluid accumulation in the lungs. Now, first of all, the lungs can't oxygenate the blood as well anymore, but also it becomes much more difficult for the right side of the heart to pump the blood through the lungs. There's more resistance. So now the right side of the heart has to work much, much harder, and this is called pulmonary hypertension. So now if your circulation suffers and if there's less oxygen in the blood, obviously you can get shortness of breath and you can have fatigue because you can't make energy as well. So you could indeed get some shortness of breath from this, but realize this may or may not have anything to do. This pulmonary hypertension can occur with or without peripheral hypertension. So to say that hypertension, high blood pressure, causes shortness of breath is again pretty far-fetched, that it's really caused by the pulmonary edema and it may or may not be associated with high blood pressure. Symptom number six is tinnitus, which is another word for ringing in the ears. And it's not pronounced tinnitus because then it would be spelled I-T-I-S and it would mean inflammation of the tin or something. But tinnitus is pretty common. It could happen if there was very high blood pressure and the blood pressure was causing friction in the blood vessels and then that could be causing a noise. But if that was to happen, you would probably have a noise that would be more like a humming or a rumble or a roar. It'd be a pretty low frequency, like a murmur kind of noise. And that type of tinnitus does occur, and it's usually due to something vascular, but not necessarily. However, most tinnitus by far is a high-pitched. It's more like a hiss, more like 
white noise. And that type is not due to any vascular problems. That's a neurological issue, and most likely it's because of stress. It's what we talked about before with stress when we have an elevated sympathetic response. When we have a chronic sympathetic response, that is typically what's going to cause that hissing tinnitus. But what's the purpose of blood pressure? Usually when people talk about it, it's because it's too high and we talk about it as if it's something bad, just like cholesterol. High cholesterol, that's bad. And therefore we assume that lower is always better. But blood pressure, just like cholesterol, the body has it there for a reason and it's regulated and it needs to be the right amount for the circumstances at the time. So the purpose of blood pressure is obviously to circulate the blood. We have the blood sitting in the blood vessels and it's not going to move until we put some force on it, some pressure. And there are two things that that pressure has to overcome. The first is friction. We have to push all this blood against friction. We have 60,000 miles of blood vessels, even though most of them are super, super tiny where these blood cells walk through one by one, it's still going to take a lot of pressure to get this job done. The second thing is we have to overcome gravity. So if you have someone lying down, then their head, their brain, and their heart is at approximately the same level. So now there's very little gravity to overcome. We're mostly just overcoming friction and we're putting enough pressure on it to keep it circulating at a certain speed. But if we are standing up, what happens is the heart is several inches, typically about a foot, foot and a half below the brain and gravity tends to pull all of the blood into your feet and now we need a pressure to get it not just back up to the heart but from the heart up to the brain. So now we have both the friction to overcome and the gravity. So this is the primary reason to have blood pressure at all. But then we also need to be able to adapt to changing demand. Sometimes we need more blood delivered and sometimes we need less. And whenever we have higher blood pressure that means two things. It means that we're moving more blood, but we're also moving it faster. And whenever we have higher blood pressure, we have more vasoconstriction. Your stress system, your stress response, the sympathetic nervous system, it causes vasoconstriction. And some people think that would cause less blood to go through, but that's not true. When you reduce the diameter of the blood vessel, yes, you have to use a little more pressure to get the blood through, but what happens if you cut the diameter in half, you increase the speed fourfold, because you have to pump it much, much faster to get it through. And that is what happens when we have exercise or stress. When we have to get the blood there super quick, that's why we reduce that diameter. And anytime we have that happen, when we have vasoconstriction, that dramatically increases the workload on the heart. It has to work much, much harder. Now, if this is temporary, like exercise, that's a good thing because now your heart gets to work hard for a while and then it gets back to baseline, it gets to recover. That means that you train your heart to perform. You train your whole vascular system for high performance and that's very, very healthy. However, if we have chronically high blood pressure, now it's elevated a little bit, but all the time, that is really, really bad. Just like chronic stress is really, really bad. We wear out the body, the organ, the body part, and we never give it the proper time to recover and rebuild. Number seven is nausea and vomiting. And this is pretty serious. If your blood pressure goes so high that you start putting pressure on the brain, you increase the intracranial pressure like we talked about with a headache, to the point where your brain function is compromised, now you could get that nausea and vomiting. 
And you could also get this from a stroke. And a stroke is where a portion of your brain dies because it's not getting oxygen. It could be that there is a clot, there's a little plug that travels in the vascular system and it gets stuck and it blocks off everything downstream from that clot. Or you could have a bleeding stroke where a blood vessel bursts and you have a bleed into the brain. Either way, the brain tissue downstream from that accident is going to have no oxygen and it dies. So this would be pretty serious, obviously, and it could cause nausea and vomiting. Now, this, of course, is a very loose association to high blood pressure. So what they're thinking is that if you had a stroke and high blood pressure is a contributing reason for a stroke, then maybe if you had a stroke, you had high blood pressure. But in the moment of the stroke, you're not going to worry about your high blood pressure. It's completely irrelevant, right? So again, it's a loose association and you don't want to think high blood pressure if you have nausea and vomiting. You want to worry about the stroke at the time. And of course, that is a medical emergency and you want to be in an ambulance as soon as possible. Number eight is localized weakness. So here we're talking about something like a paralyzed limb. If you become paralyzed in an arm or a leg or in your face, if you lose the ability to speak or if your mouth drops on one side, again, these are signs and symptoms of stroke. Very, very serious. These are emergencies. And even if high blood pressure is a contributing cause strokes, that's not what you worry about when there is an emergency like that. Number nine is chest pain and also known as angina. And this can happen if you have a blockage in your coronary arteries where you're not pumping blood. So whenever you have an exertion, you get chest pain. This is called heart disease, heart failure. It can also happen with this pulmonary hypertension that we talked about. If you have that high blood pressure, between the heart and the lungs, and that right side is working really, really hard, this can cause that as well. But just like on the previous slide, even if there's an association between high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease causing angina, the high blood pressure is not the direct cause, and it's not what we're concerned with when you have angina or a heart attack. Again, these are medical emergencies and you want to get in an ambulance right away. Number 10, dizziness, confusion, and anxiety. This typically would happen from a lack of oxygen. If we lose or if the supply of oxygen is decreased, then we can experience things like this. It could be, again, as severe as a stroke, or it could also be a transient ischemic attack. So this could be sort of, it's like a mini stroke where you could have a plug that's just a partial obstruction or one that dissolves within seconds to minutes where the body kind of resolves it. You could also have a partially blocked blood vessel and something causes a vasospasm. So you get a transient, a temporary blockage or lack of oxygen. That the body should recover from, but it's still a really important sign because these TIAs are usually kind of a forerunner to a full-blown stroke. So that's, if you have the TIAs, that's a really good time to take your health seriously and start looking into improving your health. This obviously is an emergency, whether it's a stroke or a TIA, you want to get that checked out. But most of the time where you experience dizziness, confusion, or anxiety, it's going to be much less severe than a stroke or a TIA. If you have a temporary dizziness or lightheadedness, especially if you go from lying down to standing up or even sitting to standing up quickly, now most of the time that's going to be because of low blood pressure, not high blood pressure. So if you have low blood pressure, then that is also a form of not enough oxygen because the higher blood pressure delivers more oxygen. So if it's too low, then this could be a problem with not getting enough. 
And most of the time that you experience lightheadedness when you stand up quickly, then it's going to be because of adrenal fatigue. You remember the guy that was lying down versus standing up? Whenever you go from sitting or lying to standing, you have your gravity is going to pull the blood toward the feet and there won't be any blood left for the brain unless you create very fast, instantaneous vasoconstriction. And it's the adrenal glands that make the hormones to create that vasoconstriction. As soon as you stand up, we need those blood vessels to tighten up to keep the blood in the head. Otherwise, gravity is going to pull it down. So it's like this little miracle. Every time you stand up and you don't get lightheaded, then there's all these things that have to work in your favor at precisely the right time. And number 11 is your bonus. So this would be the absolute first, the number one earliest sign of high blood pressure. And I hope that you learned a good bit so far through the video, but rather than memorizing a bunch of stuff, then why don't we just measure the blood pressure? That would be the best and the earliest way to figure it out. And as cheap and as available as this is for 25 bucks you can buy a little blood pressure monitor and check it once in a while or if you have a problem then you check it every day to see what it is so if it's above 160 over 100 now that's not good so what i would suggest then is that you do some breathing exercises you sit down you take a few minutes you take some slow, calming breaths and you see if it changes. If you can bring it down under 130, under 135 in a few minutes, then it's no big deal. It's nothing to freak out about. You want to keep measuring it and understand it and you want to learn how to monitor so it doesn't get worse and it doesn't stay chronically in this range. Or if it's even higher, over 180, over 110, now this is way more serious like we talked about. Now, again, you could sit down and do some breathing exercises. And if you can't bring this down in just a few minutes, now this is an emergency and you want to get some help, some medication to intervene to bring it down until you can learn how to manage this on your own. But the key to understand is that the number one cause of high blood pressure is metabolic disease. It's insulin resistance. It's things that we can measure and understand and change. So I created a blood work course because the most common question people ask me is, how do I know if I'm insulin resistant? How do I know how my kidneys are working? How do I know what my stress level are? And not all, but most of these answers we can get from blood work. So I've ran a beta test as a course. We've done some live streams. We've recorded them. I've gotten lots of good feedback. There are over 15 hours of video now posted where you can go and learn this stuff. And I'm going to build it out. I'm going to add more cases, more examples as people ask questions. I'm going to make videos that illustrate that in the form of cases and it will all be posted in addition to or replacing some maybe of these 15 hours. Now because this was kind of a beta test we launched it at the lowest price ever so as soon as we have this solidified and built out that price will go up substantially. So if you are interested you can check out the link down below and if you get on the course we have one more call where we're going to do a ton of cases and answer a bunch of questions and then you will have lifetime access to all of these videos so you can start understanding more about your body and take charge of your health and make some changes. If you enjoyed this video, you're going to love that one. And if you truly want to master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell, and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.